All right, so as we go into the chapter six uh, PowerPoint here, the one thing I do want to show you is how a lot of these slides have notes at the bottom already kind of embedded in, which takes basically the content from the book, which is kind of cool. It depends on which slide it is, but some of them have info and some don't. All right, so I'm on slide number six, which is kind of where the, for me, the PowerPoint starts. Uh, and we talk about what is a computer network. And, and really, in its like ba most basic form, it is a way that we are connecting machine to machine to be able to get information from one spot to another without having to use that sneaker net that we joked about, which is like take a floppy or a flash drive, put your stuff on it, walk it over to another machine, plug it in and pull the information off of it. So much more convenient when they're all just hooked together. And then when you throw in the whole wireless aspect, I mean, it, it is kind of um, miraculous that way. All right. so. One of the first types of things that we think about when we're connecting machines together is how we're actually moving that information. And for most of us, we use a device called a modem at home. Okay, granted, you guys probably have never even really experienced dial-up, but you know, when we started going up on the internet, we had to have a modem that would connect to an analog phone line, and it would literally dial a phone number Another modem would answer it. It would make a whole bunch of sounds, like you probably have heard them, right? And, and really what that is, it's called a handshaking process. They're trying to figure out what protocols they can talk at, what speeds they can communicate at. They make the connection, and then the data flows. And in order for the information to travel, it moves from a computer, which talks a digital language. It would be converted into analog sound waveforms, and then reconverted to digital on the other end. The beauty of the digital networks that we use now, so when you guys do regular internet now at home, there's still a modem, right? So if you have a cable connection at home, you still have a cable modem. Whether you own your own or you uh, lease one from Time Warner or Spectrum or, or Charter or whatever you're using. And then the same thing happens when you have uh, DSL, is you have a, a box. It, and, and basically, it just allows you to convert whatever signal you're sending to the, the format that moves across the wires that your internet service provider is providing. DSL from AT&T is different from the way um, signals tra travel across coax cable and fiber. Different protocols are used to get the signals to the house. Once they get past that modem, then everything just moves to like the standard kind of networking connection that we have here, whether it's wireless or wired the protocols that work across those. So we have these different ways of connecting. The thing that becomes interesting when you start to look at these technologies is, remember, you know, I had that Kahoot question about the physical transmission media. And these three are the primary physical transmission media that we use to connect up our networks and the internet. Most of the internet these days, especially in an advanced country like ours, the backbone of the internet tends to be fiber optic. And the reason that is, is because it's the fastest. However, the technologies that preceded are not gone. And in fact, you know, they're, they're growing too because they're very reliable. And that's really kind of the crux of it. The one that you guys, or a few people thought wasn't even real, right? Because they didn't answer it in the Kahoot, is this thing called twisted pair. So if I look at the network cable that's connected to this teacher station here, I'm assuming it's, I'm assuming it's wired. Um, maybe it's wireless. But that uh, has an Ethernet cable going into it. And inside that Ethernet cable, there's four pairs of wires. And each pair is twisted around itself. Right? These are just two thin copper wires that tra transmit information. For an Ethernet connection or a network connection, we only use two pairs of wires, one to send and one to receive. So Eric, why is there extra wire? Because if something goes wrong, you, have, you can switch to the other wires without having to rewire it, right? Mm -hmm. What a pain it would be to have to pull the wire out of the wall. What's that? It is. And they also had this thought that at some point, we might do something else with those wires. And then there are people that actually have these ways that they use the extra wires. Um, but the truth is, 
uh, they're just extras inside there. Um, you know, that, that's one approach. Some people also carry multimedia over it, and some people move like smart home technologies over them. Um, the, the thing that's fascinating about it is why are these twisted around each other? What's the point of that? To reduce Yeah. Here's what's interesting. If you think of an old television set, right, and you think of antennas on top of the TV set, there's basically two wires that run to the antennas, and usually you have two antennas. Do you take those antennas and cross them around each other? No, because you know what happens when you start to wind them around each other? They reject radio signals. They don't accept them. So by keeping them separate, radio interference can bleed in. So the reason they twist these is to reject ambient radio interference. The twisting itself blocks it. Most of these types of cables will also have, especially the higher grade ones, will have like this like metallic foil inside there that also does the same thing. So when you see people like wearing aluminum hats because they're freaked out that the government's listening to their thoughts, they, may, they might be on to something, right? <laughs> because by putting that, that, that shielding around their head, right, it's like if you were in a metallic room, you're not going to be getting radio signals, right? So that's kind of like the, the thinking there. This technology is the original technology that we use to move all phone and network traffic and still is responsible for a majority of it inside of buildings. And in some cases, uh, even external to buildings. Um, and the reason is copper wire I mean, for as inexpensive as it is, it's not that inexpensive, it is a very reliable technology. And that's why we haven't moved away from it. Can anybody name for me what the first networking device was? The first networking device. Yeah. Uh, you would say a computer? No. And then when did it happen on top of it all? Well, all right, so that, that was a way to move a, a message across a distance with smoke signals, and, you know, and this is a classic networking thing. We also talked about how, like, if you're on, on a ship and communications are down, you got the guys with the flags, the semaphores, and they have flashing lights, right, and they're sending signals over a distance. But when we started to move information electronically from one point to another, it was a huge revolution. What was that? Telegraph is correct. You said telegram, but telegraph is the actual device. And if you look at what these things are, you notice it's just this like device that's got like a little magnet and there's a circuit that runs in and every time that the connection is made, it makes a click. And you'd have these people that would get trained, like this guy, right? They get trained on Morse code and they would learn how to like do the right series of uh, clicks and, and short and long clicks to form letters. And then all they would need is a pair of copper wires running to wherever they're going and a power source to get the, the signal to move. And now all of a sudden, if you had that wired up, you could have a telegraph in like New York City and a telegraph in Washington DC, click out a message, it is there immediately. Prior to that, if you wanted to send a message to somebody, write it on a piece of paper, seal it with wax so that nobody opens it, right? Give it to a guy on a horse, maybe send some guys with him with guns to protect him, and you know, get that horse going as fast as you can and get there. Could be days to go from New York to Washington, D.C., actually hours, but still, now we have this capability to move messages instantly from one spot to another at the speed of light. When did this happen? 1830s, folks, was the first connections. By the mid-1800s, we had transatlantic cables moving signals from the US over to England. Do you know what a revolution that is? To be able to send a message instantly, especially if you're going across an ocean, where it would take months to cross an ocean, all of a sudden you're doing it in the blink of an eye and faster. It's huge. Technology. Twisted pair, copper wire. That's pretty mind-boggling. Even more mind-boggling is how did they run that wire across the ocean? They had really long rolls. And they would splice them together, drop them in the water, and just keep going. And the fact that it even worked was mind-blowing, right? 
That technology, of course, uh, led to our phone networks, right? So if I can send like clicks over the line, if I can set up a microphone and a speaker, I can use the same wires to actually capture a voice, send it over the wires, and be heard on the other side. And that was the prevalent technology, those two technologies, well into the 1970s, folks. It wasn't until that point that we started to see other approaches surfacing, including the ones that we're about to see. So if you could take one pair of twisted wires, right, and really have a, a, a way to send a signal back and forth, how does the coax work? That's one single wire. Works a little bit differently in that you're really, on that single wire, you're broadcasting frequencies that travel over that wire, just kind of like you broadcast radio signals through the air. They just travel through that wire. Notice that that one wire, when you're at home, it's all your cable TV, it's all your internet, your phone's coming over it. How do they get all that stuff onto that one piece of wire? They use this technology called multiplexing, where they send things at different frequencies, and then all you have to do, like a radio receiver, is tune into the right frequency to get that part of the signal. And that's how you can get thousands of TV channels over that one wire, along with your internet, and, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Notice that they, inside that coax cable, there's like this weird plastic sheathing around the core wire, the one that actually sends the signal. And then wrapped around that is a braided copper wire, which does the same thing as the twisting of the twisted pair, which shields out interference. Yeah. <laughs> Higher grade coax will also have that foil shielding inside there as well, right? And um, you know, one thing that if you ever have problems with your internet at home, one thing Time Warner, excuse me, Spectrum will come in and do often is maybe like if you've had like wire that's been sitting there for 20 or 30 years, they'll replace the wire from the poles of the house because they have higher grade wire now for the higher grade services. So that's one thing that you should think about. The other technology that's been around for a number of decades now, maybe you know, pushing on 40 years or so, is this fiber optic technology that really is fiberglass. It's a form of like plasticky glass that does not transmit electromagnetic pulses or waves over it. It transmits light. That's kind of wild too, right? It is. Now, the, whoever thought of this, they probably stole it from some alien UFO or something, right? <laughs> like Velcro. <laughs> um, but that's what the backbones of most of our networks are, even here internal in our buildings. We run fiber connections from all the major you know, network points in the building because fiber is faster. It does have some issues, though, and that is it has a limited transmission range. So after you transmit, I forget what the range is. 200 inches, uh, feet, 200. miles, uh, so meters. Wait, are you talking about fiber optic? Fiber optic. optic. It, it really depends on like, the type of fiber optic. It does. Because yeah, the, the only thing is that the light distribution is after a while dissipates. Yeah, they have repeaters. These days, in the part of the world that we live in, if you walk down your alleyways or streets and you look up on your poles, you'll see these big, fat wires up there. And every once in a while, you see these like weird plastic boxes that sit up there, too, whose job it is to retransmit the signals on down the line. So the backbones running through our neighborhoods now tend to be fiber optic. Um, and that technology is pretty astounding. I remember the original promotion of this, when they came out with this technology in the 70s, they, they ran these commercials. And they're like, you can tra transmit 8,000 phone calls on something the size of a human hair. That's pretty mind-boggling, right? At least back then it was. Yeah. Simultaneous. Um, that wasn't really a lot of bandwidth, and now we, we've upped that significantly. Where a lot of internal networks like ours here, we ha I think we have a 10 gig gigabit backbone running through campus here. Yeah. Right. That's, that's pretty astounding, and all of that runs on, 
on fiber. Are there other technologies that we can move signals with? Wireless. Yeah, wireless. Cellular, right? So a good example of, um, you know, and you guys probably see these things, like out and about. You see these towers, and they have like these little weird things on them, right? And usually it's three transmitters on three sides. I don't know why they came up with that approach. And they kind of angle them certain ways. And sometimes they're out on poles out in the open. Sometimes you'll see that um, company share towers. Sometimes they put them up on buildings. Sometimes, like if you go to Summerfest, right, they bring in temporary ones because all of a sudden we got a million people hanging out at the lakefront and everybody wants to make a phone call and do selfies at the same time. Right, and they don't have the bandwidth to handle it. But you see these all over the place. Another technology that often piggybacks, see these other dishes right here? What are those? Yeah, it's a microwave tower. So these are traditional microwave towers. And what's fascinating about this technology is before fiber optic became prevalent, most of the country, have you ever, did you ever stop and think like, how did they do like network television back in the 50s and 60s? They really didn't have satellites yet, but not a lot, right? So if somebody's doing like a live TV show in New York City, how are they watching Saturday Night Live in Los Angeles live? Microwave. Yeah, microwave. They use microwave relays, and it is a line of sight technology. So the only way it works is you take one of these dishes, and you point it from one to the other, and it's got to be like perfectly focused and tuned in, and you have up to a 30-mile range. That, that was a traditional range. I don't know if it's changed. And you don't see it that much around here anymore. But if you go out west, you know what? How do you think they get the signal over the mountains still? You know what a pain it is to run like wires like on a flat piece of land? You gotta set up a pole, you gotta run the wire from one pole to the other, you gotta string it up and keep stretching it, right? Then you, you guys ever cross the Rocky Mountains? Anybody made that drive ever? It's pretty intense. In fact, there's, in certain spots, there's only certain ways to get through the mountains and they're not easy and they're twisty, turny, up and down and you know, kind of freaky. They can't run poles through there, can barely get a car through there. So they just set up power up on top, tower down here, and, and they get the signal across the country. So still to this day, there's a lot of phone and network traffic that travels that way. And it's a, it's a technology that has not gone away. And yes, it does use microwaves, the same kind of microwaves pretty much that you cook your food with. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be a bird or a person standing in the line of sight of that thing. Right? Right? We also have this technology now, too, and we have like zillions of these things up in the sky. We have communication satellites. Um, and then, of course, down here on the planet, we have satellite dishes. And they used to start out really huge. I knew a couple people, like way back when, that would have satellite TV. And they literally had like a dish that was like 10 feet across in their backyard, but they could get everything for free okay. back then yeah. you just had to know what you were doing yeah now you have these little dishes that are like this big right you put it on your porch or whatever you know and hopefully the bird birds don't land on it and doesn't get covered with snow but as long as you have a good line of sight to the satellite you can pull stuff in and yes people do use that for internet you ever watch like those like weird alaska shows and those guys are like way out in the middle yeah. of like above the Arctic Circle, with, and they live all by themselves, and it's like, hey, but they're on a computer. How are they doing that? Satellite. It's the only way to get internet and, and communication up there. But that is an approach. The only problem with that kind of technology is the lag time it takes to transmit from Earth up to the satellite and back. Because that trip up and back is like going around the planet several times. So there's, there is a little bit of a lag, and then there's also like all the transference of uh, signals and stuff. But, you know, I'll tell you what, without satellites, most of you guys wouldn't know where, to, where you're going, right? Because we use GPS on our phones. That's driven by satellite technology. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Start to look at these uh, technologies and their advantages. Um, 
interesting story, you guys. When I um, bought my house, it's been almost 20 years now, roughly 20 years. I bought the place, really old house, built in the 1880s, needed to be gutted. So we gutted the place, put in new electrical, new heating, new plumbing, everything's brand new, right? And I'm like, since we got the walls open, this is my thinking 20 years ago, I'm like, this is my chance to wire the place, right? So I bought this like bundled wiring. It had two ethernet, two fiber, and two coax in a bundle, right? It came in this big roll. And I thought I was really smart. So I like, like yeah, I'm gonna do like three or four drops and every, so every wall is gonna have a drop. So I'm ready for the future, right? And then Wi-Fi came up. <laughs> So I spent like $500 on this roll of like bundled wiring back then, which is probably like $2,000 now, right? And what do I have plugged into that? <laughs> well, I, I have a couple things plugged into it. But I have all this wire in the wall I don't need. Yeah. Then Wi-Fi came in and kind of blew it all asunder. But let me ask you what? Which is better, wired or wireless? Wired. Wired. Wire is always better. Yep. My son discovered that in his gaming, right? I got him to plug in, and he's like, yeah, Dad, I'm never going back to wireless. <laughs> Why? Because the wire gives you consistent speed. Yeah. Nobody can tap into your wire unless they're inside your building. Right? But Wi-Fi made it easy to bring networking into the home. Think about how many devices you might have on your network at home. Remember we listed all the stuff that we have? Yeah. It's all that stuff, plus probably a whole lot more. Pretty amazing. All right, then we talk about some protocols here, and that is um, the things, the rules that we use to actually move the information across our networks. What I think is fascinating is we think of Ethernet the wire, you know, the, the wire part of it, as the wires, you know, I, and even I sometimes like get into the mindset where Ethernet is the wires. No, it's not. Ethernet is the protocol to move the information over the wires. On top of Ethernet, we have a thing called TCP IP, which is the network protocol that over the years has won out, right? When we connect to the internet, TCP IP is the network protocol that all of our computers use to run our applications and do our addressing schemes. There was a time, a little, like maybe a little before I uh, built my home network, um, where there, other, there were other protocols out there that were pretty prominent, like NetBuoy and SPX uh, IPX, and there was a Novell protocols and none of them had one out but what happened is the internet got popular in the mid 90s and TCP IP even though it wasn't the best of protocols to move data was the one that won because it was the one attached to the internet which is kind of a, a fascinating thing and all the other protocols have basically gone out the window if you guys ever get into vintage gaming right if you're fire up like an old copy of like Doom or something yeah. and you wow. go, well, I, you know, every once in a while, there's like set, there's like these option windows you can go into and you can connect, you play like over a network and it still has all the old network protocols listed because not everybody used TCP IP. Some people used SPX, IPX or whatever the heck it was called because it was faster, right? And if you're trying to kill somebody in a network game, the faster protocol wins, right? Because so milliseconds, you know, whether you're shooting one guy or the other. So if I plugged into the Orbitro, would it still have the old protocol that you wanted? Uh, I don't know about, <laughs> I don't know about Oregon Trail, man. <laughs> that, that's a real primitive one. <laughs> Here, your oxen need food. What are you going to do? <laughs> All right. The, uh, the thing that's really kind of interesting about the way that TCP IP works um, and how networking works in general, and this is fascinating. Um, and this is something I, I learned a long time ago that has always stuck in my mind. I have videos I could show you too, but I think I'll just describe it. When we did um, telegraph and we did telephone, 
we did a type of uh, switching that is different than how our networks work. Think about, does anybody ever saw the Andy Griffith show or even know what the heck I'm talking about? Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. So it's like back in like the 50s and you're like hanging out in some little southern town and it's the sheriff and his deputy and, and then any time they wanted to make a phone call in that town, they'd pick up the phone, crank the phone, right, because that's what you had to do back then, and what it did is it rang the operator at the central office, and it was Mabel, that was her name, yeah. and it would say, Mabel, can you hook me up to the post office? Yeah. And she would like take your phone, plug from, like a little plug from your connection, plug it into the post office, she'd hit a thing, and then the phone would ring and they'd know to pick it up, right, right? that's how it worked, it was a manual process. Right? And that type of switching, when you made that connection, that line is open. So the wires that are connecting are completely used by that conversation, both the send and receive. And when you're talking to somebody, you're, you know, you say something, the other person, you know, thanks for a little bit and then responds, and there's like dead space. But you know what? You're still tying up the connection whether you're talking or not. It's a really inefficient use of network bandwidth. What they came up with as a way to move computer signals across the lines was instead of having a dedicated line like that, they figured out that they could have many computers share the same line by breaking up all the messages into what we call packets. So if I had a letter or a picture like we saw in that video, you take that message, let's say it's just like a piece of paper here, and I'm going to demonstrate because it's really fun, right? I'm going to rip it up. Right? Because I can't fit all this into, into that wire. So I have to tear, tear it apart into little pieces. And then each piece, I number it. So I know this is the first one. It's got a from address and a to address. And it's just a piece of the message. Right? And then I do that with the whole message, whatever it is. Picture, text, whatever. And then I cast it off into the network. Here's the fascinating thing about networks is all the little pieces of that message can travel over any of those wires in any direction to get to the endpoint. And then somehow, they all get there and they're magically reassembled back into the same message that they were. The beauty of it though is all the dead, dead time on the network, right, because you think of how you use a computer, even now, you hop up on Google and you're like, videos of cats doing silly things, enter. So you just sent like a little burst of information, went to Google, Google's doing its things, but your line is now sitting open, just sitting there. Nothing's happening. So why not share that? So packet switching basically allows lots of users to do the same thing, so all your messages are kind of like intermingling through that space, getting to where they're going on the other side of the internet and coming back. But that same line, so think about it at home when you guys are all online at the same time. You're watching TV, somebody's talking on the phone, people are watching YouTube, they're playing video games. It's all happening at the same time. It's all going over the same wire. And if you got Spectrum, it's one copper wire. Kind of mind-boggling when you think about that technology. But that's what's really made it possible to maximize bandwidth far beyond what we thought we could with the simple technology that we came up with that originally was just a dedicated like Morse code or voice communication. Even now, our phone calls, most of them, depending on who your provider is and how you're connected, are not traveling over the wires and Mabel's connecting you. It's all actually being converted to traditional IP network traffic and then gets converted back to analog, which is kind of strange. But now, many phone calls can travel those same wires too. That's why they could make those claims with uh, fiber optics. All right, I know that uh, our time is kind of waning here and I don't want to waste any more of it and I want to do a little bit of a demonstration. Um, you guys can read up more on the types of internet connections and network connections uh, in your book. Um, enough at least to do the homework that you need to do. But I want to really talk about this little device here. So this video is going to end here.